Right, so I guess it's about time we get started. Um, so, uh, my name is Julian, for those of you, I mean, some of you already know me. Uh, but yeah, my name is Julian. I will be talking you through LAMPS, or at least a brief introduction to LAMPS. Uh, this is going to run over two sessions. This session is going to be predominantly uh, to do with um, just the very basic introduction. Uh, you know, how to run a program, what do you put in an input script. It's going to be very fluffy, very, very easy just to help those who have maybe never used LAMPS before, maybe never used an MD code before to learn a bit about it. And uh, I'll take questions as well. And next session, we'll be delving a bit deeper into what one can do with LAMPS, how to in compile your own version of LAMPS, how to compile on GPUs. I might not do that, but I'll explain how to do that. How to hack LAMPS, how LAMPS files works, and things like that. But today, simple. If you've never used it and want to learn how to use LAMPS, hopefully by the end of this, you'll be able to run a program, at least on Archer. And next week, it'll be slightly more complicated. Uh, hope that's okay with everyone. Let's begin. A uh, brief introduction to LAMPS. First of all, I've been told I need to put this slide. You're welcome to reuse this material. You're welcome to borrow it. You're not allowed to profit from it. That kind of makes sense. It's my work. Uh, very briefly, the basics. What is LAMPS? LAMPS stands for Large Scale Atomic Molecular Massively Parallel Simulator. Uh, I'm not sure which came first, the acronym or the horribly long name, but uh, there you go. Uh, it's developed by Sandia Laboratories, and um, one of the really cool things about LAMPS is that there is a huge, huge, huge amount of user support. Um, and it's, it means that like half of the time, if there's anything you ever want to do MD-wise, even not necessarily molecular dynamics-wise, um, if there's anything you want to do, like in Monte Carlo, molecular dynamics, discrete element methods, all that sort of things, there are user packages, there are uh, actually developed packages. It's, it's a great program. It's really easy to use. It's all written in uh, C++ nowadays, uh, but it's nicely written C++. Anything that makes it into the LAMPS packages is usually uh, good code. And uh, that makes it really easy to hack. And that's one of the reasons it's lovely, because you can take your LAMPS thing, and if there's anything you ever want to do with it, you can take the code, delve into the code, and change what you need. But we won't talk about that too much today. Uh, you can just download LAMPS for free. It's open source. Open source is always great. Uh, there's a link there for if you want to download it. And uh, just again, as a disclaimer, everything that I'm going to talk about today, everything that I'm going to show today, is all in the LAMPS user manual. So if you decide that instead of uh, listening to me talking for the next two or so hours, that you'd actually prob rather read the 1,043 pages of LAMPS manual, there's a link there. Feel free to go there and read what you want. Um, yeah, this session, just to give you a rough idea, I will start this session by running a LAMPS code just to show you how simple it is. Uh, I'll show you how to run the simulation locally. I was going to originally do it on Archer, but Archer is down today, so um, that's not happening. But you know, we'll, we'll make it do. Um, and uh, after that, I will run through said LAMPS code to explain how we got the outputs that we did, what the outputs are. Uh, I'll, in running through this, I'll be explaining things like how the simulation is packed, how you prepare your simulations, how you define your particles, what a neighbor list is, how molecular dynamics works, and things like that. At that point, we'll go for a short coffee break. Uh, during the coffee break, I will be reading through the chat to see if there are any questions, and that way I can answer them when we come back after the coffee break. Hopefully, the coffee break will be at around 3-ish for about 15, 20 minutes. And then after that, uh, we'll come back, finish whatever we've not talked about in the uh, LAMPS input file. Don't know how much that will be. And then I'll sort of go through some of the advanced options, which are you know slightly less than just your basic Leonard Jones fluid tutorial. And we'll finish with, uh, again, any questions you guys have. And I'll show you a 
really quick, really simple uh, exercise for if you want to try out lamps locally. Um, I, yeah, so without further ado, how do you run lamps? So, you should now all see some shell, a shell, a shell, a shell. Cool. I cannot see my shell, but you guys can see my. That's always great. Oh. Uh, so. There we are. We are in the LAMPS workshop. Um, you will have on Archer a link to, uh, well, there's two places for this. Everything in day one material uh, is available on the sign up page, on the course web page, which is, um, uh, which you can get to by going on Archer, on just the Archer tutorials website. Uh, all of those files are available there. I think there's one slight change to the PDF, but whatever. And uh, you can also find all of those files are in a shared directory on LAMPS. Um, and all of the code is there, week one slides, and all of the code, including in our Archer submission scripts. So, boom. here we go. That's a link for if anyone wants to download everything that I'm about to use. Uh, so, I'm in my LAMPS directory. I've got my executable called LMP uh, MPI. That's just how the executable is called when you compile it for um, uh, MPI protocol. I go into day one materials, and there you've got the slides that I've done that, that, that you guys have already seen. A, an Archer LAMP submission script, which we're not going to use today, but we'll probably I'll probably talk a bit more about that next week for if anyone wants to run LAMPS on Archer, and. Uh, a subdirectory and our uh, input file in .lj, which is a simple input file for Leonard Jones fluid. For those of you who know what that is, for those of you who don't know, we'll talk about that in a second. How do I run lamps? I take my executable and I input in, in .lj. Now I never remember whether I need to do um, this, so I'll do it in case so that it doesn't crash on me and I don't look stupid. Processor. Oh yeah, uh, there, there we go. That's that's lamps running right there. Uh, let's make that full screen. There we go. Um, and it's outputting a certain number of things. Uh, what it's outputting are first column is the time step. So it's outputting every 500 time step to screen. It's outputting the temperature, the total energy, the potential energy, the kinetic energy, the pressure, the volume, and the density. You'll notice that the volume and the density, or those of you who, who look at numbers you know, faster than I do, uh, will notice that the volumes and the density are fixed. That is because we are running a fixed volume system. And it just happily runs for the 50,000 time steps that I've set it to run. After which it stops, it gives you a lot of information. This information can usually be very significant if you're trying to speed things up. In particular, it tells you how much time you've spent calculating uh, how much time the program has spent calculating pair interactions, how much time it's spent on neighbor lists, uh, how much time has been spent in communication, i.e. how much time is spent for one core to talk to another core, how much time in writing the outputs, and all the rest. Most of this stuff we will cover more likely next week than this week. Uh, Specifically, communications and outputs we will cover more next week than this week. But uh, pairs and neighbors, we should know by the end of the day if you've never come across those terms. Uh, but yeah, that's that's it. That's how you run LAMPS. You get your executable, you input your input file. That's it. It's easy. There you go. Uh, the slightly harder bit is usually what do you put in your input file? And that's what I'm going to try to talk about today. So, uh, so uh, what is LAMPS? LAMPS is a molecular dynamics code. What does a molecular dynamics code do? Well, it runs uh, Newtonian classical physics, basically. It's a classical Newtonian physics simulator where uh, 
it considers like you, you set up a system with a certain number of particles. They can be atoms, they can be softballs, they can be whatever you want. But you start with a certain number of particles in a box, and you define uh, three things. You define the uh, you define the starting velocity, the starting position, and the potential energy for all of these particles. And uh, starting with all of the particle velocities and positions at time t, because you know the velocity and because this is classical physics, you know that the particles will move until something hits them. And what you do is you say, as long as I only move my system for a small amount of time, small enough that uh, no particle collisions will occur in this time step, I should be able to move my particles forward and they won't crash into anything. So you do that. You move your, part your system forward, all of the particles in your system forward by a small amount of time, delta t, and you update all of your particle positions to that point, uh, which is step two there. And from that, you calculate all of your, um, you calculate all of your uh, particle Sorry, a second. Uh, yeah, you calculate all of your particle potentials, uh, the potential energy based on where your particles are now, and for every particle you find your potential energy, and from that potential energy you find the force on the particles, and from that you find your new velocity, and from that new velocity you're then able, you're back at the starting position of, you know, all of your positions and all your par uh, particle velocities and all of your energies, and you can go one more step forward. And you keep going forward step by step by step by step until eventually you get a simulation that actually looks like it's doing something. Um, a, one of the biggest trick in uh, molecular dynamics, a bit of a black art, is to decide how big or how small your time step delta t needs to be. Make it too big and you will not see a lot of uh, the collisions that should take place, which means that you're essentially simulating an unrealistic on physical system where particles are able to fly through one another without any interactions. Make it too small and you will be sat twiddling your thumbs waiting for the simulation to finish for a long, long time. I've done both multiple times. They both have huge negative effects. Um, so that is essentially molecular dynamics in a nutshell. What are we actually doing in our LAMPS input script? Uh, Looking at our code, let's actually look at the input script a bit more. Uh, there we go. Just a check. So, this is our input script, and I've actually try to comment it reasonably well, so hopefully people will be able to use this in future. Uh, but yeah, this is our input script. This is what I ran. And as you can see, half of it is comment, frankly, but uh, it's, it's under 100 lines, and I would say probably 50 of them are comments or you know, empty space. Uh, but that's all you need to do. You need to, so roughly speaking, you need to set up your simulation box. You need to define your interparticle interactions. You need to define your neighbor lists and how you calculate them. Define the simulation parameters. What rules are you setting on your world? Do a last few things of what do you, you know, what do you want the starting velocities to be? What sort of outputs do you want? Notice that here you've got your step, your temperature, your total energy, your potential energy kinetic energy, pressure, volume, density, the same things that we've output before. How do you want your system to update? And how long do you want your system to run? That is everything you need to um, define. That's it. That, that, that's all. It sounds like a big list of about 10 things, I guess. If I say it really quickly, I could say make anything sound that simple. But, but this one is particularly nicely simple. Uh, so very quickly, uh, not even very quickly necessarily, but yeah, well, Starting with the first chunk. Um, starting with the first chunk, what am I defining? defining? Uh, so the first thing I do is I define my units as Leonard Jones, uh, which means essentially it's just saying for the rest of the simulation, I will be using this type of unit. It's reduced units if you've ever heard of them as well. 
essentially I'm saying that uh, the distances are relative to the diameter of the particle, energies are relative to the minimum of the um, energies of the particles, temperatures are relative to reduced temperatures, etc, etc. Uh, that's what I mean by Leonard Jones units. Uh, LAMPS has a ton of different units that you can use. Uh, you can always find any of the things that I talk about by just googling LAMPS, in this case LAMPS units, which is what I'm doing in the background. And it's got uh, different types of units. It's got LJ, it's got real units for if you want to use, uh, I think that's angstroms, I think it uses joules. Um, let's see, uh, masses grams per mole, uh, distances is an angstroms, femtosecond for time scales, kilocals per mole for energy, that makes sense actually. Uh, etc. etc. There is some metal things for if you want to do metals. You can do everything in SI units if you want. Um, quite often SI units are not the smartest units to use because they end up being way too small or way too big for whatever you want to do. However, there's a couple of other programs that you can link with lamps, including I think lights for people who are into their discrete element methods. Uh, where if you want to be able to go from one to the other easily, having everything in SI units is good. And there's a bunch of other units that you could all find online. Um, so, uh, next, atomic style. Atomic style is just defining what sort of system, you know, what, what, what do your particles look like? This is where you define, you know, are your particles spherical? Are they atomic? Are they aspherical? What sort of aspherical are they? That sort of thing is in your atom style. Um, again, there's a ton of them. Uh, you can have like dipole particles. I've used dipoles a couple of times. You can even have hybrids. If you've got uh, particles, well, I've done this. Uh, if you've got particles that are both atomic and have dipoles, you can do hybrid atomic dipole to have both of the styles at the same time. Double the fun for the same amount of code. Um, next is dimensions. What sort of system are you running? We're running a 3D system for here. Uh, in this case, you, know, you can do 2D or 3D. I don't think you can do, I mean, 4D, you couldn't visualize quite uh, anyways, but uh, I don't think you can do linear systems, but you can restrict your 2D systems so that they're linear, I suppose. Uh, boundary conditions. Boundary conditions are super important. Uh, you can set them to essentially be periodic, non-periodic. You can set some of them to be periodic, others not to be periodic, uh, and things like that. What do I mean by boundary conditions? I've got a handy picture on my slide. Um, there, uh, if you look at periodic boundary conditions, essentially the box in the middle, there are nine boxes, the box in the middle, uh, the darker one, is your simulation. And everything that happens in there uh, is what you simulate. But what happens when a particle goes across a wall? So if you look at the blue particle with the arrow, it has just come from the simulation next to it and come through there. Essentially with periodic images, you're saying my box has no boundaries or no physical boundaries, but to make sure that it's still physically relevant whenever a particle exits through one side, a periodic image enters through the exact opposite side. Um, this is really useful for doing any sort of uh, bulk calculations of which a lot of simulations are in bulk. Uh, it saves a lot of time. There are some issues with it. There are some fun issues with it, which I'm happy to talk about later in this um, session. But, but yeah, that, that's periodic boundary conditions in a nutshell, basically. And uh, LAMPS, you can define periodic boundary conditions. You can define non-periodic boundary conditions. I think there's a third one. Let me go, Google that real quick. Um, yeah, periodic. Oh, you can do shrink wrapped as well if you want to. What is shrink wrapped? I can't remember off the top of my head. But yeah, never used that one. Uh, but yeah, so you can shrink wrap if that's what you fancy. Um, yeah. So, so that's kind of the first four lines of your code. The first four lines of your code are really are really about 
rough idea of what your system's going to be like. You know. After that, we get into a, a bit more details. Here, you're actually setting up, you're starting to set up your actual particles. What are you simulating? And here, the lattice command is an easy way to um, set up your system. Uh, you want to set up your system from scratch without having to have created your, your system, have placed your particles with their positions before. Uh, the lattice command and uh, create atoms command, all of this is a great way of setting everything up without having to have done it elsewhere. LAMPS is usually quite good at doing all of that. So what does this mean? Uh, here we are defining how our particles will be set up. They will be in a uh, uh, SC, I think is just normal square lattice. Uh, I think it's square cubic, I think. Um, Basically, SC is you have one particle in every position. Um, there we go, simple cubic, thank you very much. Um, but yeah, so SC, you've got one particle at every single position, uh, and then you're defining the density of your lattice, so how close your particles are together. In this case, I've set my density at 0.6, which is reasonable for a um, Leonard Jones fluid. Next, you define a region, and my region is going to be a box, and it is a box, it is a simple block, and my box is going to go from 0 to 10 in the x direction, 0 to 10 in the y direction, 0 to 10 in the z direction. That tells you, um, that tells you your total region on which your lattice is then superimposed, which means that my final simulation box uh, will be a 10 by 10 by 10 lattice such that the point density is not 0.6. I create my box so that it's in the simulation, and then I create my, uh, my atoms, i.e. at every single one of those points, I place a single atom. Uh, this gives us our... Um, this gives us our starting uh, simulation box, which looks like that. And yeah, it's a super exciting cube with a thousand particles, one at every position. Uh, this one's at a density of about 0.4. I reduced the density so that the cubes weren't over, the, the, the spheres weren't overlapping. Uh, yeah. But that's setting up your simulations, setting up your atoms in your simulation. There's other ways of doing this. Uh, Depending on what sort of things you're trying to do, you can, instead of setting up uh, your simulation box in LAMPS, you can input, uh, you can prepare inputs. LAMPS has a great, uh, great system of reading data files. You can write your own data files. There are some great codes for writing your data files for you if you're feeling particularly lazy. One of the really good ones, which I've just realized I've not talked about in these slides, is called Pathmole, where essentially you are able to... Um, uh, are the units, or is it angstroms? Uh, the units in the box, uh, Angie, are, uh, in this case, they are uh, in terms of sigma. So the unit is, the unit is um, linked to the size of your particles, because we're using reduced Leonard Jones units. So that was the question, are the units in the box, uh, in, of the box dimensions arbitrary, or is it angstroms? You can change your units by changing the unit style you use. Uh, where was I? Uh, yeah, so, so you can also prepare data files. Uh, you can uh, set up a simulation. You can even run a previous LAMP simulation uh, same with density. The density for Leonard Jones systems is, uh, it ends up being number of particles over volume. So yes, it's the same. You can always change your units of density uh, or based on the unit command you, that you've chosen, you can change uh, your, like what the units of density are. Uh, usually, I don't know if it's possible to change your units halfway through a simulation. I expect not, but I've never tried it. You were mentioning... Ah, yes. Uh, you were mentioning uh, how, to, uh, how to make some code to make uh, data files. Yes, I was. I was mentioning a code called Pacmol, and Pacmol is a lovely, a lovely thing where you can define your uh, particles, and then it will randomly pack them. You can define the random packing to be 
in a specific part of your box. So if you want to create a micelle, for instance, you can pop your code randomly and say the heads or the tails need to be within this region, which already preforms your micelle a bit uh, and things like that, because it is a lovely piece of software, which I should really have included in my slides. I apologize. I will also include this code. Uh, you're able to do quite a lot of this in lamps as well, but it's a lot less visual and it's a lot more difficult to realize whether or not you've made a mistake. Um, so that's inputs through data files. And the last form of inputs that I've come across, there's probably a few more that I'm forgetting. The last form of inputs that I've come across is using restart files. Sometimes lamps simulations can take a while. Uh, here at EPCC, we take care of Archer, so I need to plug Archer every so often. Sorry. Uh, but, um, but yeah, say you're running on a HPC cluster, a high performance computing cluster, at some point there's a time limit. And if your simulation is going to take longer than that time limit, LAMPS allows you to stop the simulation before that time limit and write a restart file and then start a new simulation, reading it all the positions and um, velocities and uh, forces and potential energies from that restart file to keep going. Uh, those are the three different types of outputs that I can, that I've seen regularly used, if I'm honest. So, so at this point, we're eight codes, in, uh, eight lines of code in, and we have done. Uh, we've set up our simulation so far. Like we've got everything where we want it to be, and we're ready to sort of say how our how our particles should move. Um, so the next thing we're going to define is we're going to define interparticle interactions. Uh, and uh, interparticle interactions, there's not many here because we're just doing a simple Leonard Jones fluid. But basically, here you go. Here you define stuff to do with your particles. Essentially, you're saying, OK, so I've got atomic particles. I've already said that my atom style is atomic. But my particles are going to be Leonard Jones particles. And not only are they Leonard Jones particles, they are going to be Leonard Jones particles that are cut off. There, there is a cutoff. And at 3.5 uh, sigmas, at 3.5 particle diameters, that um, the Leonard Jones potential, I'll stop calculating it. This, of course, leaves a. Um, the, this leaves a discontinuity in the energy and the force. So just to make sure that I don't have any issues from a simulation point of view, I will use this pair modify here to shift my Leonard Jones potential so that whatever the energy or force value is at 3.5, I will shift it up, uh, shift my potential up so that it's at zero. And then I will set my um, all of my particles of type one, and note that uh, so so pair coefficients is literally the particles interactions, and it goes for particles of type one interacting interacting with particles of type one, they will have a uh, sigma an effective diameter of 1.0, and they will have an epsilon an energy of 1.0. Uh, in this case, because when we created atoms, we only created atoms of one type, we could have more create atoms commands. So we could have a create atoms two and three and four and five. That is how we could create different species of atoms, if you will. So if I wanted to have a binary system, I would have a second create atoms called create atoms two, and I would set a different pair coefficient for this. But in this case, because we're doing the simplest of simplest cases, uh, we only have one, one type of atoms, and all of their interactions are defined here. Uh, you can also, sometimes some interactions will, um, will be the same for all particles, even if you've got a bunch of different particles. One thing you can do is, uh, instead of 1-1, one, one, you can do star, star, to say that all particles, particles of any type interacting with particles of any other type will have, in this case, this sigma and this epsilon. So this particle diameter and this uh, interparticle energy. Uh, that's that. And the last bit here that we're defining is the mass of our particles. 
i.e. we've only got, again, one type of particles, and all of our particles have a mass of one because simplest system. If you have 20 different particles, you could have a bunch of masses. If you're running a non-Leonard Jones system, if you're running an actual atomic system, your pair coefficients would be numerous if you've got some carbons interacting with some hydrogens, interacting with some nitrogens or whatever. And, you know, sometimes you've got like a, you know, sometimes you've got a lipid, uh, uh, what am I saying? Uh, you've got some hydrocarbon in there where you've got different types of hydrogens with different interactions at different positions, then you can end up with a nice, lovely, large number of pair coefficients. Uh, I've been lucky enough to not have to do this too often, but I certainly have a um, couple of friends who have had to have 30, 40 pair coefficients. Uh, incidentally, I need to remember that for next week. But LAMPS usually gets a bit unhappy if you have more than, I think, 10 pair coefficients. And I can show you how to make it a bit more happy next week. Uh, in this case, though, we're way away from 10. I've only got one because I'm simple. Cool. Uh, so very quickly, let's move back to the slides because, you know, again, this is the simplest case, but there's a lot of other things you can um, specify. Here we're using Leonard-Jones interactions, and I've done a nice, you know, roughly speaking, this is the Leonard-Jones interactions. I've truncated it at 2.5 rather than 3.5 here, and uh, there are two curves there. The lower curve is the non-shifted one. The higher curve is the shifted one. As you can see, they're nearly on top of one another. And that's only going to get better the further away you go. Um, so, so they're basically the same. It doesn't really make a difference in this case. Um, LAMPS has, I checked this, 221 different pair styles. You can, you know, uh, we're talking Leonard Jones here, but there are a ton of other pair styles you could go for instead. Um, you can again find them all on the um, all in the lamps manual, of which I definitely put a link in these slides. But yeah, if you if you want to have dipoles, you can have dipoles. If you want to have uh, Buckman, uh, sorry, Buckingham potentials, uh, another atomic potential, you can have that. If you want to include electrostatics, if you want to include long range electrostatic effects, those can get added as well. Um, short range electrostatic effects as well. Loads of things. It even allows you, like at the moment I'm going at this from a very uh, basic point of view, but lamps, you can do molecular dynamic simulations that are atomistic. You can do uh, molecular dynamic simulations that are uh, hugely coarse grained. I've, I mean, I've simulated things that ranged in size from about one angstrom to about 10 microns over my simulations in LAMPS. So it's all about, you know, different force fields work for different uh, scenarios, and it's all about finding the right force field. LAMPS starts off with, as I say, 221 different types. Uh, and on top of that, one of those 221 is the lovely LAMPS hybrid type, which allows you to combine any of those 221 with one another in any weird and magnificent way you want to do this. Uh, which leads to a lot of possibilities. Uh, again, we're doing Leonard Jones systems, so relatively easy. We're just considering pairwise interactions, but what we're not looking at as well is other things. The bond things. What if you've got a, you know, two particles that are bound together? It can be a chemical bond. It can be that you've got a dumbbell and you want to make sure that your particles aren't able to break free from one another, whatever, things like that. There are 17 different uh, bond styles. For those ones, I've only ever used one. It's the harmonic one, but there's a bunch of others. There's also uh, angle styles. What if you've got three particles and there's an, uh, got three bound particles, there's an angle between the three of them. How do you keep that angle fixed? How much can that angle fluctuate? You can define that with an angle style. Dihedral style, what if you've got four particles that are bound, or even a chain. Like, how do you measure the torsion of that middle uh, of that uh, middle bond? And uh, the restrictions that you put on that are all dihedral styles. And 
there's only 17 of those, but that's still a lot. And last is the improper styles, which is for improper dihedrals, a uh, small picture of there underneath. Uh, I've never used those. I have a couple of friends who have used them. But, uh, but yeah, again, you can, you can consider these, um, these interactions as well. And yeah, essentially, this is just defining how your particles interact with one another so that you're able to, after that small time step, work out what the energy is on every particle, work out what the force is on every particle, work out what the velocity should be for every particle so that you can go through that next time step. Uh, that's interparticle interactions. Neighbor lists. Ah, neighbor lists are fun. Uh, neighbor lists, very briefly, is uh, it's a very simple way of saving computational time, basically. Uh, imagine you've got a system, and instead of our tiny system of a thousand particles, you've got a system which has, I don't know, uh, let's say, let's say a million, two million, whatever half a million, uh, loads of particles. And uh, as I said, the entire idea of molecular dynamics is you've got all of your particle positions and all of your particle velocities and all of your particle energies and forces. You move the system forward a tiny amount of time. You recalculate from those new positions the forces and energies, or the energies and the forces in that order. Um, and then from those, you find the velocities. Now, calculating the energies specifically as you'll have seen from the previous slide, um, as you'll have seen from the pre previous slide, slides, at least for this Leonard Jones system, we are only considering pairwise particle interactions, i.e., we are only considering interactions between two particles. There's ways of doing more in lamps, but let's not get into that too much. Um, so that means if you've got a million particles. Uh, you are you have to you have to consider the interactions between every single pair of those, which gets you a million squared divided by two pairs, uh, which is an awful lot of calculations. And if you've got a system size of a million particles, chances are that the particle in the bottom left hand corner is not going to see the particle in the top right hand well in the middle of the simulation box. And uh, because of that. You know, why are you spending time, why are you spending computational resources trying to um, trying to work out the energy that atom, bottom left-hand corner, feels from atom, middle of the box, when you already know that it's probably zero? Uh, and one way to not have to calculate this is to use neighbor lists. And the idea for neighbor lists, here again for the Leonard-Jones uh, interactions, is uh, you're, you've got your Leonard Jones cutoff, and you only care about particles that are within this cutoff at this time step. Um, uh, and you've only got, uh, yeah, and you've only got to worry about uh, the particle interactions at this time step. Uh, however, uh, imagine instead of having just this one short Leonard Jones cutoff. Uh, you've got a second cutoff, which is slightly bigger than the Leonard Jones cutoff. And you say, this is the cutoff for, at this time step, I'm only going to consider the, you know, I only need to calculate the interactions for the particles within the Leonard Jones cutoff. But I know that because of my time step, if I increase, if I go forward 10 time steps, only the particles within my neighbor cutoff will still are still likely to enter my Leonard Jones cutoff. I.e., in the next 10 time steps, the only particles I have a chance of interacting with are the ones within my neighbor cutoff. Then all of a sudden, instead of having to calculate uh, interactions between all of the particle pairs, you only need to calculate every time um, the particles within the neighbor cutoff distance. You can make a bunch of neighbor lists so that every particle has its neighbors at time step zero. And then for the next 10 time steps, you only consider the interactions within, um, with the neighbors within that list. At the 10th time step, you recalculate this neighbor list with the same cutoff and everything, rebuild that neighbor list, and you know that from that 
time step 10 to the time step 20, you are only interacting with those neighbors. You keep doing that every so often, it saves you having to do a bunch of different pairs uh, to calculate a bunch of pair interactions. Um, so that, that's neighbor lists and why you might want to use them. You, you usually, again, this is very hand wavy, I'm aware of this, but you usually end up, it's a bit of a dark art knowing how many time steps uh, you allow between, uh, how, many, how many time steps do you allow before recalculating your neighbor list? It really depends on a lot of things. Usually the best way of finding that out is to calculate the diffusion coefficient of your system and then work out how quickly particles can diffuse outside of your box. Quite often as well, you can check a small bit of, um, like, you can check by reducing your uh, time between, um, uh, sorry, let me restart. There are two things at play when you set up a neighbor list. The first one is how often do you rebuild it? And the second one is how far away from your Leonard Jones cutoff are you considering particles? Uh, obviously, if you rebuild your um, if you rebuild your neighbor list loads, your particles aren't going to be able to move very much, which means that that reduces the distance the the cutoff distance. Which means if you are renewing your neighbor list loads, you don't need as big a neighbor a neighborhood cutoff. But if you want to not rebuild your neighbor list a lot. Uh, and do it instead of every 10 time steps, do it every 100 time steps, then you need to consider larger cutoffs to make sure that your particles, uh, that you don't lose particle interactions. Uh, usually the best way of finding out what the right cutoff to, um, cutoff to uh, time ratio is, is by either considering your particle diffusion if you don't want to do that, another good way of doing, uh, of calculating this or of deciding this would be to do something along the lines of set a, set a cutoff distance, set a time, reduce the time by half. Um, if you're still getting the same answers, then you're still fine, basically, is the hand wavy way of um, doing this. But that is, that's cutoffs. Uh, cutoffs bit tricky, but not too much. And in terms of how, you know, how many lines of code? Well, it takes two in lamps, because, you know, lamps is hugely nicely done. Um, where's that? That's there. Boom. There you go. First thing is you're saying, I want a neighbor list, and I want my labor, neighbor list cutoff to be not 0.3. In this case, we're in Leonard Jones unit, so not 0.3 atom radii further than my Leonard Jones cutoff, which means that the neighbors that I will consider are those within 3.8 of any center of particles. And then the next bit is uh, I want to update my neighbor list every 10 steps. So delay means uh, this is the minimum amount of time that must happen before I rebuild my neighbor list. So I want to rebuild it every time step. And then every is um, is to say, and I'm happy to wait a bit longer or not. In this case, I want it every 10 steps on the dot. Uh, and that is my neighbor list. Uh, at this point, we are nearing the halfway point of both the code and the session. So I'm going to take a moment to check the questions, see if I've answered them. Um, how often is the neighbor list updated and does it have an impact on the accuracy of the calculations? Uh, I think I've answered that, but just in case, you define how often your neighbor list is updated. If you don't update your neighbor list often enough, you will miss out on interactions, which means that your system tends to be not physical anymore, i.e. you're simulating fake, fake effects. Uh, but if you... If you update it uh, too often, you can lose in computational time. Quite often, if your systems are small, you shouldn't really bother with neighbor lists. Like for a system size 1,000, you're not going to gain that much time doing this. Uh, but it's an option. Uh, that's that one. 
Uh, does LAMPS implement many body potentials? Uh, I think LAMPS does implement many body potentials, and if LAMPS doesn't, then you can force LAMPS to. Um, how are global interactions taken into account? That we'll get to in the second part of this session. Uh, but you can, I, I think, and let me know if I'm getting this wrong. Am I right in saying that by global interactions, you're asking things like gravity, things like external electric force fields for particles and things like that? Uh, if that's what you mean, uh, then uh, it, there's a way of doing that in LAMPS, uh, which is essentially through fixes. And I'll talk about that after the break. Uh, would you suggest neighborless for coarse grain simulations? Um, Yes, 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 I would. Uh, depending, dep <laughs> there are, coarse grain simulations can mean a lot of things. Uh, in certain cases, certainly you can use neighbor lists for coarse grain simulations. Uh, it's uh, like on quite a lot of uh, shorter range interactions have a truncation at some points. Uh, you don't have to truncate things necessarily, or you can get really far with um, things like electrostatics with uh, forces like uh, PPPM and things like that. But uh, for all of the short range interactions that you can get in coarse grain simulations, you can still use a neighbor list. Um, and I have done. So I, I have previously done simulations I'm, of uh, dipolar systems. So systems of dipole particles. And those are micron sized in real life. So it's hugely coarse grained because I was doing one micron sized particle is one sphere. And for that, there is a truncation. And if you want to run a large system, you save a lot of time by having a neighbor list. Uh, you do not truncate your long ranged electrostatic interaction or dipole interaction in this case, but you do truncate your, um, your uh, short ranged what happens when my two particles are hitting one another interactions. Um, so that's that. I think there's a couple of more. Uh, and I think with that, uh, hey, it's exactly three. Perfect timing. Uh, so let's take a 20 minute break so that some of us can go for coffee if we want it. If we don't have any questions, I'll go into some of the more interesting details as to how to run your simulations, including how to set global interactions, how to set things like gravity potentially. Uh, we're not looking at anything too drastically fancy. I mean, this is roughly what's coming up. But there are a lot of fixes. There are a lot of computes. And it, I think this is really, really one of the nice things about LAMPS is quite what you can do. Um, by the way, I keep talking about atomic systems. I can also talk about coarse grain systems. I can also talk about discrete element method systems. Uh, if, you, if you want me to talk about specific types of systems rather than what I sort of learned molecular dynamics on, feel free to ask me to change perspective. I can definitely do that. Um, and I've tried not to use acronyms. But if I have, and there are certain acronyms where you're like, I don't know what this means. Um, please ask me what the acronyms are, and I'm happy to tell you. Or please tell me what acronyms I've used, rather, and I'm happy to tell you what they mean, and maybe then we'll give you a definition of the term as well, as best I can. So uh, can you please talk a bit about how to get a potential in LAMPS format uh, from a Polish paper? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so the first place I'd go to is um, if you go. Okay, unfortunately, I tried not to do. I, I tried not to have to show you this, but uh, uh, let's see if I can do it. But if you go, if you Google lamps pair styles, uh, you get a list of all the pair styles that lamps has. And roughly speaking, you could plug in any of those pair styles for uh, into the into the code that we had before, uh, and and you know as long as you've put the correct input, as long as you've got the right numbers in the right places, uh, you can um, 
uh, as long as you put the right bit of code in the right numbers in the right places, you can use any of the however many hundreds of pair of tiles they have. I think 221. Um, 221 styles is a lot of them. That is a like you know there are a lot of um, pair of styles that have been published that. Um, Sorry, where am I? Yeah, 221 is a lot of pair styles. A lot of published work uses pair styles that are already implemented in LAMPs. It might not necessarily, quite often they use conventional naming methods. Sometimes you'll get something which has a slightly different name, but you should be able to get it like all of the big ones, the DVLOs, the uh, Gaussians, the Harmonics, the Leonard Jones, the uh, uh, granular for uh, discrete element methods. The, I mean, you can even do Yukawa uh, potentials. And I'm just reading them off at the moment. Uh, they're all there. Now, if you've read a paper where they've got some brand new force field that, uh, you know, they've come up with for that paper, quite often you'll need to delve into LAMPs and code it yourself, unless they've been nice enough to do that for you, which quite often they don't. Um, so that's that. That's how I would get a potential uh, in LAMPS format. The potentials are essentially your pair styles, and the pair styles are there's a bunch available. If it's not one of the ones you're looking for, you can just um, code it in yourself. We'll talk about that not after the break, but next week. And when I say we'll talk about that, I mean I'll show you a brief overview of how to do it and not actually do it. Can I use the pair style command before read data? Hmm. It depends on what input you have in your read data file. Uh, the first couple of lines of the read data file are usually things like uh, what particles are in your data file. So, so if you've got like five different particles in your data file, it'll say I've got a particle one, particle two, particle three, particle four, particle five. And um, you need those to have been defined before you can define pair styles, which means that I think you must have your, pair, your read data before your pair style. Cool. I think with that, we'll take a break here, I think. And any questions that pop up between now and 20 past, I will answer at 20 past. Let's begin. Um, so to start off with, I quite like that someone found out that the answer is in the manual. But uh, very quickly for Miguel, uh, while rebuilding neighbor lists, uh, I'm going to start off by reading some questions, answering the questions. Uh, so starting with uh, Miguel's, whilst rebuilding, re uh, while rebuilding neighbor lists, is there any difference between a command delay 10 every 1 and a command, say, delay 0 every 10? Uh, the delay is literally how long you must wait between rebuilds. So delay 10 every one means that you must wait a minimum of 10 steps before even considering to rebuild. Whereas a delay zero means you don't have to wait at all. I mean, you build it now, you build it next time step if you can. Um, and the every is... Um, where is it? The, the every is uh, essentially, it, it's how long, I can never remember for the every. Uh, but I think for the every, it is, it's, it's a weird thing, which is build the neighbor list every this time step. So, so basically, the delay 10 every one versus. So, yeah, so the difference is this. Uh, if you delay 10 and build every one, essentially, you must wait 10 and you build every 10th one. If you delay 0 and build every, every 10, it would actually give you the same thing of you would be delaying 0, but you would build every 10th step as well. But it's when you get things like they delay 100 every 10 that you start getting weird things. Um, it is in electrostatics, usually with electrostatics, uh, it depends on how you do. There's different ways of doing electrostatics. If you do not truncate your electrostatics, 
then even if you do truncate your electrostatics, if you do not truncate your electrostatics, you must recompute your electrostatics. So the question is, in a similar vein, are electrostatics recomputed every time steps or only within the neighbor sphere? Um, for electrostatics, if your electrostatic interactions are truncated, then you can use a neighbor cutoff. Uh, I imagine that if there is a uh, if it's a short range, long range electrostatic effect, it might be the case that you would recalculate the short range electrostatic effect, but the long range ele electrostatic effect is to do with the simulation box that you're using. Um, and that means that uh, that will get updated every turn. Uh, so possibly, but be careful, would be my answer. And finally, uh, is the penalty for adding conditionals for neighbor lists rebuilding large? Uh, I'm not quite sure what you mean by conditionals in that one. Uh, but basically, if you add conditions for how often you rebuild your neighbor list or how big your neighbor list is, it can get pricey, but it can get pricey for bigger simulations. I think that's what you're asking. But if it isn't, post again, and I'll be more than happy to answer. Uh, Angel asks, uh, there's an EAM potential uh, in a paper, but you cannot find the interatomic potential repository, even though they've used lamps on the paper. How could I import the potential into lamps? Uh, so I think LAMPS has an EAM potential uh, at this link. Maybe you want a different style of EAM potential. Uh, I would start by checking out whether the pair style EAM he, the, that I put in the chat is what you're after. Uh, if it isn't, then to recode your own is something that we'll talk about next session. Uh, and then Ji uh, Hongxi, uh, answers the keyword question, neighbor list question. Okay, cool. Uh, I don't know what paper it is, so I really can't uh, tell you. I'm sorry. Uh, are there ways of doing? One of the pair styles is called table. If your pair is a short range, if your um, if your interaction is a short range interaction, you should be able to potentially. Uh, by just setting up a table, uh, you might be able to um, essentially just say, well, at this distance, you should have this force and this energy. This distance, like this distance between particles, you'll have this force and this energy. And do that for a bunch of different values, and then it'll extrapolate the bits between the points. Uh, that might be an option. It has its upsides. It has a lot of downsides as well. but. If it's just a case of you want to simulate that specific equation, that might be one solution. Otherwise, if you want to simulate the exact equation that they're using in the paper, yes, that is definitely something I will be covering next week. And do you know what? If you send me the paper, I'm even happy to have a look at it to see if I can use that one as an example. I'm not promising anything, though. Um, that seems like questions. Uh, in which case, let's keep going. Uh, so we finished with neighbor lists, and the next bit we're going to now we're really going to get into the interesting bits. We're going to get into how you how you can control your simulation, how you can compute things from your simulation, how can you, you can run your simulation, how you can um, uh, how you can. Um, get outputs from your simulation. Like actually, you know, so far we've just been packing things into a box. Now we need to define how those things will move and what we want to get out of it. Uh, so we're going into fixes and computes. And for that, again, LAMPS is huge. You've got 264 fixes. These are things that will let you set things like the temperature of your system, the pressure of your system. If you want gravity, you can have gravity. You want your system to be running in a background fluid, you can set the viscosity of that background fluid and things like that. You want there to be some form of background flow, pressure flow, that sort of thing. You can do that here as well. All of those things, all of those macroscopic, well, not macroscopic, but general full simulation, um, full simulation interactions, the, the global uh, global variables, 
you set them by fixes. So uh, I keep saying it. You're probably fed up with me saying it. We are running an incredibly simple system because I wasn't sure what the level of LAMPS knowledge was. So I went for this. So there are two fixes. Two fixes, and the fixes are the following. We have fixed. Um, Let's start with, with the bottom one, up, so with the second of the two. I have fixed my system so that it is run at constant n, i.e. number of particles, v, i.e. volume of box, t, i.e. temperature. So that means that we start with 1,000 particles. We, end, we will end the simulation with 1,000 particles. Our box is a 10 by 10 by 10 box with a density of 0.6. At the start of the simulation, at the end of the simulation, we will have the exact same density. Last is the temperature. The temperature, I'm going to use a thermostat. What's essentially, it's a way to keep your uh, simulation at the correct temperature. Uh, here, I've set the temperature so that it is 1 at the start and at the end. And this is just to let you know how much I'm allowing it to vary. And roughly speaking, um, you shouldn't lose any energy in these uh, simulations. However, because of the time steps issue, sometimes you can lose a tiny bit of energy or some or weird effects like that. And you can also, like imagine you've got two particles that are completely separated at time step zero, and then, in, and then suddenly at time step one, they are completely overlapping. They will have a huge amount of energy, which will mean that they will both get huge velocities, which will mean that the temperature linked to velocity or velocity squared will be large. Uh, the thermostat, this temp fix here, is a way of controlling those mishaps that can happen because we are essentially discretizing a continuous process, uh, i.e. we are taking small snapshots of a process which should be a flow. And sometimes, even though we try really hard, our time steps might be a bit too big or bigger than they should be in very specific instances. It happens. Uh, so what this does is essentially it looks at the overall temperature of the system, and if the temperature is a bit too high, it will reduce the velocity of random particles by a tiny bit. Just give them a wee nudge to, to slow them down, make, them, make it feel like they're going through treacle for just a moment. That will overall lower the temperature. If the system is too low, is at too low a temperature, if the particles are moving too slowly, then it can give them a wee kick, speed them up a bit, so that that temperature increases a bit. Um, yeah, I'm gonna. So one of the questions is, what about the first line uh, of fixes? I will get to that first line after the second line. In fact, through editing trickery. There we go. Um, I'm now talking about the first line. Um, and that's essentially, that, that's, what the, that's what that command does. Uh, in terms of how it's laid out, first of all, fix, you are calling a fix. As I said, LAMPS has a huge number of fixes, uh, 264. Uh, you are calling one of those 264 fixes. The first thing that you are asked is, what do you want to locally call this fix? Here, I've gone for a very boring name of one, because it is my first fix. Uh, I could have named it something different. I could have named it uh, canonical, because I think this is the canonical ensemble from memory. Yes. Um, or, or whatever. I could have named it Jerry for if I wanted. It would still run. As long as there are no other fixes that have this same name, uh, then LAMPS will be happy to run. If I were to uncomment this line, now I have two fixes called one, and LAMPS will no longer be happy. Uh, boom. Cool. Uh, so that is that first bit is the name of the fix. Next is what will this fix affect? And here you can, uh, here I have said all. This fix is applied to every single molecule in my system. Uh, 
it's possible that if I wanted to, I could have set certain groups and said that maybe the top half of my box is a different group from the bottom half of my box, and I could have this only affecting the top half of my box. It's a, I'm able to do that in maps, but I didn't because, again, simple system. So the name that I've given this fix, what it affects, and next is finally the name of this fix for lamps. We are using the lamps NBT fix. And then for this, it will ask for what temperature we want. So I've given it the temperature I want uh, with the inputs that are necessary. All of this is uh, nicely online. Uh, next thing, uh, the next line is, uh, as uh, Maurizio asked, is a momentum fix. And basically, we don't need this for the simulation, but I've had a couple of simulations sometimes where I'd accidentally get flows in my systems. Uh, Essentially, because of periodic boundary conditions, sometimes if things don't go quite right, you can end up getting an overall flow in your system, i.e. because a particle that leaves the box is a bit faster than it than average, it might kick another particle and you start getting a repetitive flow that builds up and builds up and builds up and builds up. In this case, it shouldn't happen because I've actually tested the system a bit, but sometimes if your time step is too large, sometimes if your uh, velocities are too varied or whatever, you can get this flow effect and it can be quite annoying from both a visualization point of view and also because all of a sudden your temperature keeps rising because this flow is self-perpetuating and will get faster and faster and faster. Um, it can be a bit of an issue. This is a simple, useful momentum fix. This says that every 50 time steps, I re-zero the uh, overall box momentum. And I re-zero both the linear momentum and the angular momentum. I.e., I take the box velocity and remove that from all velocities. It's perfectly fine from, I believe that is the Galilean rule law of uh, relativity, or might be Newtonian. I can never remember which is which. Uh, that's what that fix does. Uh, I hope that answers your question, Maurizio. And I hope I'm not butchering your name as well. But those are fixes. And as I said, I've, I've talked about two of you, uh, two of them. There is a ton of fixes. You can fix gravity if you want. You want all your particles to fall to the bottom of your box, you can set a gravity fix. You want all your particles to fall to the bottom of your box and not to fall back out of the top because of periodic boundary conditions. Uh, you can set a uh, wall fix at the bottom of your box so that particles cannot go through that boundary. You want to, set, you know, add a flow that you can control. You can do that. Do you want to? Um, uh, uh, what else is there? I don't know. Evaporate. Do you want your your particles to slowly speed up so that they'll move against gravity? You can evaporate your particles off the system if you want. Um, Maybe you don't like the thermostat that's, you know, the the, therm the normal thermostat that's called by the temp command, um, that's called by the temp command here. There is a couple of other thermostats that do different things. Uh, loads of fixes. Uh, I've included one other one which I've used a large number of times and which I'm aware, again, is quite useful if you're coming at this from an atomic MD. Uh, point of view, but uh, here I've set as well the isobaric isothermic ensemble, where you fix not the uh, not the volume and the temperature, but instead the pressure and the temperature. And here you've got your thermostat, i.e. the thing that keeps your um, temperature constant, and here you've got your uh, barostat, i.e. the thing that keeps your pressure constant. And with those, you can set up your simulation so that you've got non-fixed um, non-fixed density, non-fixed volumes, there will be fluctuations in the box size, and, um, yeah, and, and basically you can increase your pressure to force your system to crystallize if you want, or reduce it to force it to go gaseous. Uh, but those are fixes, um, and they're quite nice. Uh, and next, we're just going to do the last final couple of steps. This will be relatively painless. 
and mean that we'll probably finish a bit early as well, which is cool. Uh, where am I? There I am. So going back to the slides. Uh, those are the fixes. The other thing that I've really not talked about because I've not had to include any in this in this uh, simple simulation, but we'll get to those later, uh, is the compute commands. And that's, if you want certain things to be output, which are not necessarily macroscopic variables, if you want, say, I don't know, let's say you want to find what your mean squared displacement is, i.e. how far on average your particles move over a certain amount of time, you can do that uh, with a compute command. If you want to find your velocity autocorrelation function, i.e. how quickly your particles forget the direction in which they're moving, you can do that using one of the compute commands. You can compute uh, the pressure of just a subset of particles. You can compute the... Um, uh, you can... I'm trying to think what are the computes. You can compute the direction that dipoles are facing. You can compute the uh, the radius of gyration of a predetermined set of particles. You can compute the kinetic energy of certain parts of the system. You can compute the pressure. You can compute so many things. Uh, again, you know, part of the reason that so many people use LAMPS is because of how much it can do. And uh, the compute command really helps with that. Uh, so, as I said, more on this later. But first, we're going to talk about other outputs uh, or, you know, how simulations run. I've talked about this before, but this is a bit more to emphasize the circular nature of uh, molecular dynamic simulations, which is, you know, it's the same as the pictures on the first slide that I showed. It's that, you know, you start off and you got your system and your system has a bunch of particles and your particles can be atoms, they can be spheres, they can be surfaces that are bound together, they can be anything like that. And uh, every single particle in your system, you give it a velocity, you give it a force, you and you give it a position. And from those, you work out using this equation, I know, I mean, I'm always wary about adding equations to um, to slides, but but hey, you use this equations for those of you who love your maths, and uh, you update your particle position, and then from your particle from your new particle position, you find your energy, and with your energy you find your forces. So from force, so 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 you start off from velocities and forces, you find your positions. Then from your positions, you find your energies and your forces, and last from those forces you find your new velocities, where you need your old velocity and the force of the new step. And you keep doing this over and over and over and over and over again. In this case, for the example script, you do it 50,000 times. Um, that's all MD is. That's all, that's all LAMPS is doing. It's I mean, doing it really well and quite fancily and over a bunch of processors, or helping you do it over a bunch of processors, I suppose. But um, but that's the basics of it. It's it's not that scary. Uh, that's one slide too far. But yeah, let's look again at the at the code. And there we go. So the next things we do is we really define the last few things we need to to run our simulation. And uh, the first thing we do is, we, as I said, we need to start with a known velocity. And here I've used the velocity command to say that my I want my atoms to have a random velocity. So all of my atoms, I want to create a velocity. I want the velocity be, to be chosen such that the system as a whole has a temperature of 1. But I want my... Um, what is it? I want my uh, I want the velocities of each individual atoms to be somewhat random. So I this allows me to take a Gaussian distribution centered around one, and my particles get some velocity along, along that Gaussian, which is randomly attributed. Which means that because I don't mind too much how my particles are moving, they all start in random directions. 
Next, I set my, my time step. Literally, my time step is the amount of time that I'm allowing my particles to move forward before I then find the new energy, the new velocity, and allow for the new forces, and allow for a new time step. That's all the time step is. If you make it too large, your simulation will crash, and indeed if you, you know, because this has been, not much has happened. I hope this crashes. I have not tried this, but I'm pretty sure it does. Um, there we go. It crashed because lots of atoms got lost. Started with 1,000 atoms. There were only eight. We told it it shouldn't lose any. That is because the time step is so large that the atoms leave the box without any fail set, basically. Um, not that worked. I'm always worried about doing these things like that. Uh, yeah, so that's my time step. I chose this one. Uh, frankly, I chose this one so that the temperature would average out nicely over the time. But yeah, uh, I've chosen my time step. And next we get into the uh, thermostyle. This is super important. This is the global variables that you're outputting. These are the things that were being printed to screen. These are things like the time step, the temperature, the total energy, the potential energy, kinetic energy, pressure, volume, density. These are the ones that I've chosen. If you go, if you Google lamps thermostyle, you can see that you can output loads. You, there, there's, yeah, I mean, I've not even used three quarters of these probably. But you know you can you can do bond energy, dihedral energies. You can do uh, enthalpy, van der Waal pairwise energies. For those of you who are interested, uh, the ratio of uh, your long-ranged electrostatics divided by your short-ranged electrostatics. All those things are possible. Um, uh, so here we're not outputting many of them, but you know we're outputting a couple. And uh, the last thing I define is the run style. And here we're using the Verlet uh, the Verlet algorithm, uh, named after Loop Verlet. And uh, yeah, essentially the Verlet algorithm. We're using specifically the Verlet velocity algorithm. For those of you who know what the Verlet algorithm is, it's not quite the Verlet algorithm. I shouldn't have escaped. Um, but the velocity algorithm, and the velocity algorithm is the one that I was showing you on the slide. So just going real quick back onto that. Um, the Verlet velocity algorithm is really this. You start with velocities and positions known from that you find your new positions. From those new positions, you find your energies and your forces. From those forces, you update your um, your particle velocities. Uh, note, for those of you who want to calculate any of these properties, uh, the they all simply uh, Taylor expansions. So if you Taylor expand RT plus delta T, you get whatever's to the right of that equation. Uh, if you Taylor expand r dot t plus delta t, you get something that looks kind of like that. And if you Taylor expand f t plus delta t, you get exactly what you would get from r t plus delta t. It's it's yeah, it's a simple case of Taylor expanding the right things to get the algorithm that works. Lamps uses velocity verlet rather than verlet because uh, they have found that velocity verlet is slight is more stable. You lose less energy just from time steps and things like that. Stability in systems is important. You don't want your system to crash. You don't want your particles to get lost. Um, but that's uh, that's that. That's um, sorry. Uh, yeah, the, the, that's essentially all we're doing. And and with that, we we've got our simulation run ready to go. Uh, there is. I will show you again just for. The benefit of you know to, to just just in case you you don't believe me, but there is nothing but commented sections after my run command. Something I forgot to mention, which can be important: um, hash is comment in lamps. 
I'm sure you probably guessed that by now. But uh, yeah, if you want to comment out something, just hash it. So then I define how long I'm running for. In this case, I'm running for 50,000 time steps because that's nice enough that you know we don't have to wait all day for it to finish. I could easily go for longer, but what's the point? Um, everything should average out. Next, I've uh, also added for your benefit. I've added a lot of um, commented out extras. The first extra I want to show you, and I think this is quite important for those of you who have never run simulations before, or indeed specifically run LAMP simulations before, uh, I'm going to start by showing you what is uh, nicely called the dump command, which allows you to uh, output the, in this case, I am outputting just the ID, the X, Y, and Z position, and the X, Y, and Z velocities of every single particle in my system. Note that I'm not doing it too much because that kind of kills ACEs. It takes ages otherwise, but actually let's do that. So after having run the exact same simulation as before, I'm going to run this extra simulation, which will output uh, the particles in um, positions. Uh, there's a couple of things that we'll talk about as this simulation runs. It runs again. Um, so again, it's exactly the same output as before. We're running, a, now you all know that we're running a fixed, um, a fixed volume simulation, so fixed density, fixed volume, which is why those last two columns are not changing. Uh, you'll notice that the sometimes the temperature the second column is slightly above one, sometimes it's slightly below one. If the thermostat is set correctly, it should average out to about one. Uh, we can check all of that as well if you guys want. This is the point where I'm thinking, this is taking a while, maybe I should have used more processors, but if I kill it now, it's going to take longer to rerun. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, in the meantime, if anyone's got any questions, please, again, as always, feel free to post them in the chat. I hope you guys are finding this interesting, by the way, and I hope that it's sort of what you were expecting. So it's now finished the first part of the run. Uh, let's go on the right thing. It's now finished the first part of the run. And after the first part of the run, it gives all of that interesting information that I mentioned before. Uh, and then it starts the second part of the run where it's outputting the uh, positions and uh, velocities for all of the particles. Now, one very interesting thing that you'll notice is that in our input script, we did not define what global variables should be output. So, because there's not been any new definition about what that should be, LAMPS assumes that we want exactly the same commands as before. So here we've got... Um, what is it again? It's a uh, time step, temperature, total energy, kinetic energy, potential energy, pressure, probably pressure, uh, density volume. Here we've got the same thing. It just assumes that we're going to carry on. Unless there is a specific command to change a previous command, LAMPS will assume keep doing the same thing, which can be good. Uh, so it's run, it's 5,000 extra time steps, and now if we ls, We've now got a brand new position.lamps trajectory. Um, I've not actually tried this, so let's see if this works. Uh, you guys can't see the. Yeah, you guys. Can you see? What can you see? Yeah, you can't see the VMD screen. Cool. Which is good because VMD looks ugly when you start. Uh, and let's maybe yeah, the positions rather than the... Let's start by looking at the positions. Sorry about this, guys. So, there you go. What does a position file look like? It is boring and full of data, but sometimes you need to play around with it. It tells you what you're outputting. The first thing you are outputting is the time step. The second thing is what time step it is. So the first output is on the very first of that simulation. Um, the very first time step, the zeroth time step, when that command is called, which in our case is 50,000. Uh, next, it tells you how many atoms you should expect to see in this 
uh, in this positions file. In this case, we have 1,000 particles. We should expect 1,000 particles. Next, it tells you the boundary of the box. Our box goes from 0 to 18, or 11.8 even, sorry, uh, 11.9. Uh, and our box is periodic. This is important because it allows uh, certain visualizations programs to know whether or not to expect mirror images, uh, periodic images. And last, here it tells us that for every atom, we will output the ID, the X, Y, and Z position, and the velocity for the X, Y, and Z position. Then, starting at atom 1, here is atom 1 with the X, Y, Z position, velocity X, Y, Z. And it keeps going for about a thousand. Well, for exactly a thousand. Uh, if it only does for about a thousand, something got horribly wrong. Um, and then after a thousand atoms, it has that same header again. Time step, we are now on time step five, uh, 50250 because we're outputting every 250 time steps. There are still a thousand atoms, yay! Our box has not changed size also, yay. And here's the new positions of the particles. So whereas, you know, we're after 250 times the X position of atom one is 4.29, whereas um, at the very start it was 3.98. It's moved a bit, that's useful. Um, yeah, so that's thing one. Why would you want to do this? Well, there's a couple of reasons you might want to output your positions, one of which might be that there are certain uh, global variable, uh, global effects or even non-global, even micro effects that you want to look at in your system. This is a great way of really delving into everything. You can output the entire information of your system in these position files. The second reason is because you can visualize them. and um, here I'm going to use one of my favorite visualization softwares, VMD, uh, and I will show you the window for it as it looks at the start, because you guys should see how messy it is. Uh, I think it's this one. Nope. It's this one. There we go. There we go. That's our simulation box in the horrible startup of VMD, but don't worry because we can quite easily change things on the fly. Uh, graphics representation. Intervals. There you go. There's our really oversized particles. Let's bring them down to size. There we go. That is what our particles look like when they are the correct size. Uh, we can zoom out. We can turn things around. Uh, I'm going to now decrease the size of our particles a bit. So this is not their real size, but this is just to allow you to see a bit more through the simulation, uh, through the simulation box. This is the position at the end of our simulation. Uh, note that we did not start recording positions until after the simulation started. So this is the position at the start, but we can go step by step to see how particles move. So this is showing us from here to here is how much each individual particle moves in 25 time steps, which is 25 times 0 0.05 uh, reduced time units. Better still, you can play the videos at stupidly huge speed because that's what VMD likes to allow you to see the simulation moving. In this case, this is not the most exciting simulation. I'm aware of that, and for that, I'm a bit, you know, I'm a bit sorry. But, um, you know, this is a lovely Leonard Jones fluids. If you're into your fluids, this is a great one. Um, and it really helps you to see. Um, and this really helps to, to answer a couple of questions, which uh, I got over, the, over lunch. One of the questions what do I mean, you know, that I got is, what do I mean by molecules or particles or whatever? Well, here in this case, uh, at the very start of our simulation, we had, we had um, our system was in this lovely uh, cubic shape with a thousand molecules, each in their own lattice space and everything. After running our simulation for a bit, uh, um, sorry, 
from this, from this cubic um, lattice, we then, on, for every single particle, we gave a random velocity to allow them to move in space. We also set, uh, if you remember, we set an interaction particle, i.e. we're saying when two particles are this distance from one another, you know, if, uh, if two particles are uh, 1.12 away from one another, then they have an energy of minus one, and that leads to them having a force of zero because they're at equilibration. But if they're, you know, 1.4 away, um, sorry, I'm getting questions, I feel. <laughs> Uh, if they're 1.4 away, then they've got a uh, they've got an energy of minus 0.5, and they've got a force which will push them together, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I seem to have missed a couple of questions. I will finish this spiel, and then I'll get to question. I'll get to questions if that's okay. Um, yeah, and so we started with. This simulation box, we put this force, we randomize the velocities, and then from that, we're able to go step by step by step by step by step to get something which looks like this, which is a complete mess. It's no, I mean, you can still see the lattice, but that's mainly because that's the periodic box, um, and which moves every time step, every every single time step, every one of these time steps, lamps will have calculated every single particle energy or potential acting on every particle, the potential energy acting on every particle. It will have calculated the force acting on every particle, the uh, new velocities of those particles from those forces, and from that it will have moved to the next time step where it keeps doing the same thing and over and over and over again. Computers are great at doing repetitive things, it's great that they do that instead of us. Um, and yeah, and that's that's it. That's that's positions, and that's what you can get from these output files. You can also, as before, you can decide to instead of outputting all of your particle positions, you can maybe output certain of your particle positions. You can uh, do all those sorts of things. Uh, I'm now going to do this the smart way, so you guys don't see the tunnel. Go back to the slides and answer a few questions before we go on to more uh, advanced things that you can output, which are super interesting. Uh, where are we? So, questions. Uh, how, do the codes uh, how is the code parallelized? Is there a way to make it more efficient use of uh, processors? The code is parallelized using the MPI library. Basically, uh, there are certain loops in LAMPS. So, one of the loops, for instance, is working out uh, the pairwise energy. You know, when I said that you can reduce, you can save time by using neighbor lists, uh, because otherwise you would need to check every single pair interaction. All of those pair interactions for every single particle still need to at some point be calculated, or even just within the neighbor list. One of the ways that you can speed up the thing is by telling your system, well, I'm going to use two processors. That way, one of them can do half of my particles. The other one can do the other half of my particles. Um, that way, I go quite a, twice as quickly, provided both processors are the same. And part of, uh, processor A will compute all of the uh, potentials on its particles from the entire box. Processor B, likewise. That's one of the ways that you can save a lot of time. Everything like velocity updates, everything like position updates, anytime you need to output anything or update anything or calculate anything, because everything starts off from a per particle point of view, you can always parallelize it across multiple processors, allowing some processors to only look at certain parts or uh, certain sub parts of your total system. Um, and that's how the code is parallelized. Is there a way of making more efficient use of the processors? For this simulation, I mean, you can use more processors to go a bit faster, but there is, I mean, we're so close to, we're so close to peak, uh, are we close to peak performance? No, you can still use a couple more um, systems. The, it depends on how uniformly dense your system is. For a very uniformly dense system, i.e. a system that's got roughly the same number of particles in every region, there is not really much you can do except use a few more processors. For systems that are not uniformly dense, you can really gain time by uh, doing what we call domain decomposition, 
And that's essentially trying to be smarter about assigning what the processors look at. So LAMPS will naively, if you've got two processors, cut your box down the middle and say, OK, you do the left half, you do the right half. But if your right half has twice the number of particles as the left half, you could speed up your system more by dividing per particle rather than uh, by, by dividing the tasks by the, so that each has the same number of particles rather than the same region size. Uh, there are ways of doing that in LAMPS. I think one of the commands is called domain decomposition. Uh, from memory, but that is definitely something that I will be talking about next week. Uh, it's not called that, but, uh, but, but there is a way of refixing mode of particles per GPU, uh, per CPU even. Uh, that answers that. Uh, uses hybrid MPI OpenMP. Uh, this one I think just uses OpenMP. You can have it uh, use hybrid MPI OpenMP. You can also use hybrid MPI OpenMP CUDA if you want to be fancy and use GPUs. Um, but in this case, the one that I'm using only uses MPI. The one on Archer, I think only uses MPI as well. Uh, from memory, from memory, don't, don't quote me on that. Uh, parallelization may have no repair interruptions with yet. That's, I think, what I, thanks. I agree with Miguel's answer. Um, can you change that command so that it writes that output to a file or to a screen? Um, so this will be the log command. Uh, very quickly, let's go back to our loved and I'm sorry if you guys are fed up of this input script, by the way, but <laughs> uh, in.lj. So that is a fair comment. Uh, at the moment, everything is being output to the screen. Uh, it is possible to have everything saved in a log file by doing log command, uh, log.lj. This happens anyways. Uh, so LAMPS will always write everything to a log file. So if you look here, um, there is this file called log.lamps, and if you look at log.lamps, it is exactly the same outputs as you had before on the screen. Uh, so everything gets saved to a file anyways, and you can define the name of that file. So if I wanted to in here, I would put everything instead to log.lj. Log I can never remember whether I should go before or after the run, so let's not try it. And yeah, uh, then everything, I think it's this way. If I remember, it's before. If I've got a file called log.lj here, then everything before log.lj will be saved in log.lamps. Everything after log.lj will be saved in log.lj. Uh, can you prevent things from running? Um, can you stop things from running, uh, from outputting to screen? Not really. I think the it might be possible, but I've never really bothered enough to to look into it because simply, if I care, I can you can just output everything to another file by doing that, uh, and then everything. I'm not going to run the entire job, but basically, there we go. We don't get anything out to screen, and now there is a file called out. Which, if we look at the file called out, it's got all of that stuff that was on screen there. Um, that's that question. Um, cool. You can specify an output. Yeah, that's yeah. Again, everyone's answering questions faster than me. This is great. I must be slow. Uh, I believe he submitted through a command line. So by calling, yeah, that's exactly what I said. Cool. Yeah. No, this is shell scripting, basically. Uh, yeah, so uh, before we finish, I kind of want to, I, I think we're about 10, 15 minutes away from finishing. I hope that's okay for everyone. Uh, but before we finish, I just wanted to briefly talk about some of the, some of the compute commands. Um, so, so here I've got three compute commands. I've got compute RDFs for radial distribution functions. I've got compute MSD for mean squared displacement. 
and compute VACF for velocity autocorrelation functions. And this is, uh, this will output files that have the radial distribution function, i.e. the average distribution of particles, of distances that particles are, based on the average density of the system. Uh, the how far particles will move over time and how fast particles will lose their sense of direction. Um, and I can do all three of those at the same time. I will start with the RDF to explain it. Uh, and yeah, for my, for my RDF, I start off. Computes are very similar to fixes. LAMPS has always the same structure in many ways for computes and fixes and lots of other things. But uh, computes are very similar to fixes. That first thing, RDF uppercase, that is my name for this compute. This compute is called RDF because it's going to output an RDF. I could call it Billy if I wanted, but it doesn't seem as sensible. Uh, it is going to compute the radial distribution function, i.e. the average position of particles versus each other uh, for all of the particles in my system, I am calling the RDF compute. Uh, I am, this is the number of bits. I am going to ask for LAMPS to split whatever domain I choose into 150 bins of equal size, and I want my domain to be 3.5 um, radii away from the center of mass of any given particle. So basically, I will only be considering particles that are 3.5, a uh, distance of 3.5 radii away or less. I will see where they fit in, and then I will average out the um, density of my system to get the local fluctuations in, in numbers, to see whether sometimes particles are slightly more packed together, slightly less packed together, that sort of thing. And uh, for this sort of command, which is a... Initially, it's a global command, but you can average it time step after time step after time steps to get better statistics. I'm going to use this fix, which will average it over time. So this fix is called RDF output because it's the bit that's actually going to output the RDF. For all particles, it's going to average my RDF over time. Uh, it's going to take my RDF every 20, it's going to calculate the radial distribution of the entire system every 25 steps. For the last 100 steps of my system, of my simulation, and that simulation is going to last 5,000 steps. So for the, essentially for the latter half of, uh, for the latter half of this particular simulation, uh, or part of the simulation, it will output the RDF. Uh, it will output all of the RDF to a file called RDF underscore LJ dot out because I'm very inventive with my names. And it is a vector style dot just because the RDF is a vector thing. Mean squared displacement, very similar, except I don't need to define a bunch of stuff. I just want the mean squared displacement, likewise for the AC, uh, for the velocity autocorrelation function. And my output is going to output very, you know, again, very similar to uh, the previous fixes except it's an average correlate because I'm outputting a single number rather than a vector, whatever. Uh, and I'm just outputting it for the entire run to a file called msd.lj, and I want a running average. So if I output it before, I want whatever the average is at. Uh, and likewise for velocity autocorrelation function, except I'm only doing the last half, I'm outputting every time step for both of these for reasons that will become obvious in a sec. Uh, so great, I will one day manage to do that on the first time. Learning from before, let's run this. More processors, not too late. Let's try four. Oh, come on, you should be happy for four. Oh, that's because it's going to out. That's me being in Egypt. Yeah, it's taking too long, and I like to see the output. At least there's something on the board that's moving, and I don't feel like I'm in a room by myself talking to a computer quite as much.
Um, still everyone okay? No questions? Everyone still okay with the course? Um, it's always scary when someone lowers a hand when you ask that question. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, please ask them on uh, the group chat or even privately if you'd rather I'm the only one who sees them. Whatever is best for you, I will answer what I can. Uh, so this is run, and we have our new output files. Uh, there we go. And our new output files are these ones. We've got log of lamps, which always gets done. We've got our position, which is commented out so it's not been changed. And here we have rdf.lj, so radial distribution, mean square displacement, and velocity autocorrelation function. Uh, and I'm now going to go into the new plot and plot out what they look like, basically. Um, so, uh, actually, before we do that, let's let's look at the RDF. The RDF has a so so. There's some stuff at the top. Very confusing. Sorry. Quick question from. So cool. So uh, you've got some stuff at the some stuff at the top, which sort of tells you this file has an RDF, and it tells you what you've got. So row zero is uh, the first row is telling you which row it is, and you'll notice that they go down to 150 because we said 150 bits. The second row tells you the uh, position, how far away from the center of the particle are you, uh, ranging from 0.1 to roughly 3.5, which is what we said our cutoff was. The third row is uh, the one that we're interested in. It's the actual radial distribution function. And the fourth row is the cumulative radial distribution function. Uh, I will plot both of these so that these, these make a bit more sense. Uh, let's start with this one. Let's start by doing it correctly as well. There we go. So you guys can't see that as well. So that's a bit less impressive. Uh, la, la, la. There we go. So uh, on the bottom axis, we've got um, our distance. On the uh, x-axis, we've got our radial distribution function. And uh, yeah, that's why does that say distance there? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, so that's our radial distribution function. And as you can see, essentially what this tells us is uh, what this tells us is that. For distances less than one, you are highly, the, the radial distribution function is roughly speaking the fluctuations around the average of particle numbers at certain distances. So the average should always be one. If you have a perfectly, perfectly uniform unit dense system, you will get just a straight line at one going from zero to infinity. However, because this is not a perfectly um, dense system, because this is a discrete system, there are actual particles who must occupy certain spaces and cannot occupy other spaces, uh, you get gaps. Uh, you get fluctuations about this density. And this is showing you what the fluctuations about this density are. And it's telling you that for distances less than one, i.e. when two particles are, uh, i.e. for distances where the particles are overlapping by a lot, you hardly get anything. There is hardly anything there. Um, the second thing you see is that for distances of around 1.12, you get a huge peak. You are most likely to find a particle 
at a distance of 1.12 radii away from any given particle, which makes sense because that is the minimum in our potential energy. Then you get a trough because uh, because right after that you get a like essentially the 1.12 region is the first shell around your particles, and after that first shell you're less likely to get a particle because there's another particle in that shell which prevents particles from being there. That's why you dip below one and then you go back above one because that's uh, the second shell, etc., 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 and then it nicely tends to one. Uh, that's the radial distribution function. I'm sure every chemist out there and every anyone who's done molecular dynamics before has seen RDFs before and are sick of it. Um, but yeah, for those of you who don't know it, that's roughly hand-waving uh, what it is. Next, uh, we can also do uh, the uh, cumulative RDF, which is exactly the same plot, but it's the integral of this plot over distance, uh, which looks like this. Not fascinating, but essentially you get your first bump there, and then it levels off, and then your second bump, and yeah. Uh, so you can output RDFs. That's great and lovely. You can also um, you can also look at your velocity autocorrelations. I think that one is. Oops. Right. I don't know. That's right. Oh yeah, there's there's a trick to velocity order correlation function. your velocity autocorrelation function uh, at the bottom is time steps the velocity autocorrelation function is along the y-axis and it's a bit noisy because we're really not averaging it very well but essentially it drops so it's short distances particles keep going in the general velocity that they were going at before and then they forget that and then the last one very quickly is the um, mean squared displacement uh, mean squared displacement, which looks kind of like that, and you sort of get all of the info there. So let's zoom in to here. Uh, let's not zoom into there. Come on, mouse. We can work. There we go. If you zoom in to there, you'll notice that you get, uh, this is just telling you the position of your particles, uh, how quickly your particles move from a given position. So at first, because of this cage effect that we talked about in the uh, velocity autocorrelate and the RDF, uh, particles stay in their shell and they move around. They're sort of stuck. They can't move very far. And then eventually they get into this linear regime. And from this linear regime, you can get the particle diffusion. And from that, you should be able to set a lot of things like, um, like your time steps and things like that. Um, so, so that's basically everything I wanted to cover this session. Uh, I would like to very quickly point you to, if you're feeling super keen and you've not done it before, uh, that's the one. If you're feeling super keen and you've not done it before, I've included some exercise material. And in this exercise material, you've got a, uh, you've got a input file which looks very similar to the one we've used, and a LAMPS exercise submission script for Archer. Uh, if you look at your input file, it's basically exactly the same, except I've added a variable. There is a variable density here. And uh, you can set this density to be any number you want. And then I have used this variable here. So when we set our original lattice, Instead of setting it as always 0.86, we are now setting it to whatever the variable density is. In this case, 0.8. Uh, and I have also used it here, the only other change to this file from the one that I gave 
if you before, I have to put the RDF within the main code rather than after it. And the RDF will output a file called RDF Leonard Jones with whatever the value of the density is. Um, if you're keen on trying out lumps, if you're keen on like seeing how things run or uh, playing around with this, if you're welcome to log on to Archer when it starts um, being available again, which should be in 34 minutes. And try to run this exercise. And the exercise is a really simple one. It's it's still it's also a very cool one. Uh, and it is simply the um, it is simply just looking at what happens uh, as you vary your density. Uh, and as you change your density, you can change your density from being in a gas state to a liquid state to a solid state, like varying it from 0.05 to 0.8 to 1.4, and see what the radial distribution looks like. You, it's one of the very first problems that um, molecular dynamics was used for, and you can recreate it. And you know, this thing was run on computers that were the size of, you know a building and they would take all day to run this and you can do this on your phone in under 30 seconds. It's kind of cool. So if you want to try that, you're welcome to try that as well. Uh, very quickly as well, I mentioned some of this software before, but uh, there's a lot of useful third-party software for LAMPs. Um, visual, uh, visual Molecular Dynamics, I talked about, I used. It's great for making pretty pictures. As you can see, my pictures were not as pretty as the ones I've added here, but hey, if you try hard enough, apparently you can get to that level, or if you don't do it live. Um, I have a couple of friends who use Ovito, which is very similar to VMD, but allows you, as you can see, it allows you different views. So you've got the cross-sectional view, you've got the full box view, you can zoom in, you can zoom out, you can do loads of special effects. It's a really cool program. It's a stupid thing to say, but it's not the one that I started for, I started with, so I hardly ever use it, but it is probably probably equal to, if not better, than VMD. And then there's a lot of packages out there uh, for helping you pre- and post-process um, Python lamps. And uh, I've put a couple of those. Pizza.py is also made by the guys at Sandia, so it's developed by the people who work on lamps or closely linked to the people who work on lamps can be useful if you want to learn uh, more about that. MD Analysis and Pilot uh, are two other ones that, uh, you know, I asked my friends around what sort of post-processing things do you use. They told me those two. I had a quick look. I mean, they told me a bunch of others, but those are the two which I had a quick look at and said, ah, oh, that looks interesting. I should really use that. And then, yeah, uh, they're both really easy to plug in. You can, like, input things from LAMPs. You can create LAMPs inputs from it and all that sort of things. If you're into Python, those of people are nowadays, here's a way that you can play around with LAMPs on Python. Um, yeah, and uh, very briefly, because one minute left, uh, for the next session, I'll start off. If anyone has any questions they want to ask between this session and next, please feel free to contact us on um, either my email address or the website email address. You should be able to get my email address. Uh, just, just Google my name, basically. Uh, but uh, yeah, any questions that I get between now and next session, I will answer because I, I don't know what level you guys have of molecular dynamics. I don't know what level you guys have of computational techniques, and I really want to make sure that all of you understand everything. So this has been a much more basic session. I will start next session by answering the questions from this session, but then next session I will be going into more um, in-depth things. I will be going into how you can compile LAMPs on Archer, uh, I, you know, smarter domain decomposition, we briefly touched on that. I'll show you exactly how it's done. Uh, and then I'll also show you how you can, uh, how you can, um, what's the word for it? How, how you can actually go into LAMPs, look at some of the code, crack some of the code, do whatever, yeah? So one of the questions I'm getting is, uh, how can I try out the Leonard Jones script that I was using? Uh, the Leonard Jones script is available um, on the Archer website. Uh, if you go into training, upcoming courses, LAMPS workshop, uh, everything from this session is available there. So you've got uh, the slides and the exercise input script and 
submission script for um, for Archer, as well as the input script that I was playing around with. Here's a link to it. Oh, Claire beat me to it. And yeah, it's uh, as Claire says, if you scroll down to materials, everything's there. And I will do the same for week two. Uh, one of the questions that I got earlier was asking um, asking me to re-describe uh, time steps, runs, and positions. That is a very good question. I, I tend to use you know the, I tend to use Linguo because this is kind of a field I'm used to. Uh, so time steps. Uh, let's start with positions. Basically, for position, uh, when you're doing a molecular dynamic simulation, you have a number of particles, and each of, this, uh, and each of those particles are somewhere in the box. And in this case, we've been using uh, Laplacian XYZ coordinates, so just normal 3D coordinates. And by particle position, I mean for every single particle or any given particle, what is its X, Y, and Z coordinate within our simulation box? Uh, that is position. Next, run. When I say run, I mean the simulation. And uh, basically, when I say uh, that, that's my fault, actually. It's, it's probably not corrupting me in a way. Uh, it's a simulation run. Essentially, it's a simulation run over a certain amount of time, over a certain number of time steps, which I need to define in a sec. And uh, whatever is simulated, that amount of time that is simulated is the run. And the last question was to do with what do I mean by time step? Uh, if we go back to the um, to, to one of the earlier slides here, um, so so I've said that we start with particles. Like basically, for all molecular dynamics um, simulations, we are assuming Newtonian systems. We're not thinking about anything quantic, anything like that, and. Um, and we're uh, we're essentially saying here are you know we, we start with our system at time equals zero and we say at time equals zero if we know all of the particle positions within the box and how fast and which direction all of those particles are going then for a small enough time after time equals zero we can assume safely that those particles will just move in that same velocity at that same velocity and same direction at that time speed without changing direction, without changing speed, without changing their behavior. So we are going to move slightly away from time zero and allow our, all our particles to move at that velocity for that slight amount of time, see where they all end up, and then recalculate, uh, like see, all, see where they all end up, which is our new position, i.e. where all the uh, particles are within the box. And then from that new position, we are going to calculate the new velocities, which we get from the new energies and forces. And with those new velocities, we are going to assume that, again, for that same small amount of time, uh, those particles are going to move without collisions. So we can let our system move that tiny bit further and then find the new velocities. And we keep doing that, and we keep doing that, and we keep doing that. And that small amount of time that we allow our run to our simulation to go before recalculating our positions, our energies, our forces, and our velocities, that is the time step. I hope that answers that question. And uh, other than that, thank you very much for attending this course. I hope you guys found it useful, and I hope you have a good rest of the day.